Hi, I'm Judy O'Bannon. Welcome to a new program about exciting outdoor life in our state. This show will open up the world of our wonderful woods and streams and wildlife, historic sites and parks. The folks at the Indiana Department of Natural Resources and Ball State University have teamed up to bring you adventure and information. So stay where you are and come with us into Indiana's great outdoors. Hi, today we're planting a garden just like the pioneers back in the 1800s. Join us today at Connor Prairie on Indiana Outdoors. Get to work, Donald. Huh? Hello and welcome to Indiana Outdoors. I'm Jill Dittmeyer. And I'm Don Van Meter. Today we're in Hamilton County at the Connor Prairie Living History Museum. In fact, we're standing in front of the William Connor home. It was built in 1823. And in a little bit, we'll speak with Gary Quigg from Connor Prairie. He's going to tell us more about the home and the other exhibits here. But first, we have a festival to attend. Indiana has so many festivals that the Indiana Department of Commerce publishes a festival guide each year mm -hmm. so people can know where to attend these festivals. Sure. This festival guide is a great resource for people. One of the festivals held each year in September is in Napanee, Indiana, called the Apple Festival. Mm -hmm. I never saw so many apples. <laughs> Hi, my name is Penny Huffer and I'm coordinator of the 25th Napanee Apple Festival. 25 years ago we had retail people uh, got together and decided that they needed a fall festival and at that point we had lots of church organizations and groups that helped did the food and it was just something to get people into the downtown area of Napanee. Basically it's just a community event to get everybody together and just have a nice day and enjoy some of the sunshine. Some of the events at the Apple Festival are the crosscut saw competition, the bed race, the pie eating contest, the apple peeling. I'm Archie Fike. I'm the champion apple peeler of the Apple Festival. I've been attending the Apple Festival for 25 years. Oh, I've been practicing peeling apples five years or a little more. I start at one end and I score it all the way around and then I go back and and then I peel it, and then I know how, what late, what width the peeling's going to be. It takes a lot of patience because one slip and you break the peeling, you're done. And we'll see how many inches Archie peeled this year. Archie Fike had a peeling of 92 and a half inches. As long as there's an apple festival, I'll be peeling apples. This is Indiana. This is small town Indiana, downtown Indiana. Perfect example of what our state and our area is about. You know, um, several years ago, Time Magazine uh, named us one of the best small towns in America. And I think you ought to come, just come see what, what it's like to be a small town and live in a community um, that is um, cooperating together to uh, produce something special, such as the Apple Festival. In my own eyes, I think folks should come out to the Apple Festival because it is a community event which brings a lot of people together and you'll find a lot of friendly folks in Napanee. 
Well, here at Conner Prairie near Fishers, you can chat with costumed interpreters and learn all about pioneer life. And here to tell us a little bit more about this wonderful adventure is Gary Quigg. Gary, thanks for taking some time out today. Thanks, Jill. Because this is a busy place. As we were talking before the interview, a lot of people have been here when they were younger and experienced the 1830s. Mm -hmm. But there's something new that's still old at Conner Prairie. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Everyone says they come here in fourth grade for a mm -hmm. field trip or they come to see Century on the Prairie, but they really haven't seen Conner Prairie if those are the only two experiences that they've had. But the new area you're mentioning is our 1886 Liberty Corner. Now, for years, we've all known about Prairie Town Village of 1836. Yeah. We're expanding into new time periods here at Conner Prairie. And 1886 gives us an opportunity to talk a little bit more about some different parts of society. For from the first time, we can actually talk about the role of religion in the 19th century. For example, we just built a Quaker meeting house, mm -hmm. and that's an experience you can come in and not only learn about the Quakers of the 19th century in Indiana, but all religions yeah. of that time. Mm -hmm. We also have a one-room district school that's set up for 1886, so you'll set up an experience, an 1886 lesson. You can compare that to what you're going to find in the village of 1836. And the way to get to this new area is actually through a bridge through time. We have an 1880s covered bridge, and it's going to be a wonderful way to transition from 1836 to 1886. Wow, so you're always constantly expanding here and, and adding new things as well. I understand one of the, your uh, jobs is to get artifacts and, and for the, for the uh, Conner Prairie. Absolutely, and we really have to gear up quite a bit because, as we've said, for years we've done 1836, but now it's 1886 we have to gear up for, and just a few years down the road, a 1936 farm on the other side of White River. So trying to find all those artifacts to make them exactly historically accurate, mm -hmm. correct, and the proper condition is quite a challenge, as you might imagine, and we want to thank, obviously, our donors, in addition to the people who let us know that they have things for sale. And we, we kind of mentioned there are these costumed interpreters that people can uh, talk with and ask questions when they come here to Conner Prairie. Mm -hmm. How do you get those people? Well, that's one of the most special things about Conner Prairie is that opportunity to actually engage a person from the past. We do what was known as first-person interpretation, mm -hmm. where our interpreters are not only in appropriate historic clothing, but also in character. They're acting as if it is 1836 wow. right now when they talk to you, or 1886 or 1816 in one of our other historic areas. But these people come from all walks of life. They are paid staff. We train them very intensely we set them up with a mentor to sit down and learn how they interact with visitors and then set them on their own to actually experience Conner Prairie. I noticed that your buildings are in good shape. Uh uh, the old spring house down here, for yeah. example. Uh, do you have spatial carpenters or people that can keep these in period? We do have an incredible staff, and uh, one of our uh, most wonderful staff members are our historic maintenance staff. And they're the persons who are responsible for maintaining these historic structures, which have come from all over Indiana. And you also offer these wonderful hearthside, hearthside suppers, and I know a lot of people probably enjoy it as well. We certainly do. January through March, you can actually go into the William Connor home, which is that 1823 nicely restored federal brick mansion and enjoy a 19th century meal. Not only enjoy how good it tastes, but enjoy the actual preparation of the meal and have an opportunity to interact with costume interpreters again in that setting. So there really is something for everyone, all ages, all age groups, every plenty to do here at Connor Prairie and we're just happy to be here enjoying it today as well. Thanks Great. Gary. Thanks for inviting us. Well, we appreciate thank it. Thank you. I like your hat, Jill. Thank you, Don. Lots of Hoosiers have an outdoor hobby that involves costumes, guns, and lots of strategy. You know what it is? Help for a bad hair day? No. No. It's Civil War reenactment, and our reporter Jason Witherwright experienced a battle firsthand near Hartford City. Civil War is one of the most important and revisited events in American history. To learn more about this time period, I went to a Civil War reenactment in Hartford City in East Central Indiana. I talked with Tom Laws, the company commander of the 32nd Indiana Company G. 
first thing you're going to see are people running around in very outdated uh, costumes, and uniforms. Uh, there you'll see the way the soldiers actually would live in canvas tents or some of them didn't even have tents, they just laid on the ground. Uh, experience the way they prepared their food. The civilians that uh, you'll see, the, the ladies, do a, a good impression of the camp followers. Uh, it's history alive. Tom told me the best way to experience a reenactment was to put on a uniform and do some marching. Oh my goodness. Whoa. Well, Tom, how do I look? You look great. If we're going on a full full scale campaign, <laughs> yeah. I'll tell well, you what, let's uh, let's see if we can't get rid of some of this stuff. Oh. I don't think it's bother you. No, uh, get that's Get rid of the knapsack right. and. It goes 40 pounds and uh, anything ba else. Or? Basically, you're wearing exactly what a soldier would have wore on, on a day to day basis, but you have one thing missing. What's that? Your rifle. Oh, right. Okay. You ready well, to go march? I'm ready to march. Let's Lead go, away, Captain. <laughs> There's so much to see and do at the Union and Confederate camps, but if you need a break from the battlefield, march on down to the Sutler Village to resupply and enjoy a different kind of entertainment. Boatmen dance, boatmen sing, well, boatmen do most anything. Dance, boatmen dance, dance, boatmen dance, and for like the body like a boat. Sutlers were merchants that were private contractors that traveled with the regiments. A regiment would have a sutler, and the sutlers sold or provided the goods to the soldiers that the military did not. Sutlers are very important for reenactments because when people come, they're, they're probably fully a third of the attraction, and the sutlers are the Kmarts or the variety stores of this hobby. After spending some time in the Sutler Village, I decided to head back to camp and participate in some new recruit training. At least I tried to participate. I completed my basic training just in time to take part in the day's final battle. As we took to the field, I felt quite confident with my extensive training. Then again, I had no idea what I was about to get myself into. The method of determining the outcome of a battle varies with each reenactment. At this event in Hartford City, officers from both sides met before each battle and agreed on the outcome. As the battle came to a close, I found out that it was our side's turn to lose. And so we withdrew over the fence accordingly, while the Confederates celebrated. Before I left that day, I was able to gather some thoughts about the importance of Civil War reenactments. I'm constantly learning new things. Uh, you know, each event, you learn something new about, especially about our country. People get a sense that war was more than just the battlefield. There was there was the refugees and civilian camps and things like that too. So that's that's what we're portraying. When I look at these kids and these kids go into schools and they see these flags or they go across the field, 
and they're looking at these colors, yeah, they might be looking at the soldiers out there fighting, but they're seeing these colors. They're seeing the national colors, the regimental colors, the Confederate colors. We like seeing it come to life. That's someone that actually gets to see and feel the... Um, well, to, to see the history being not only reenacted, but acted out. Well, Tom, that was great. Thank you so much for having us here today. It's been wonderful, and thank you for the use of the uniform. Okay, we can put you in that uniform permanently. <laughs> Make this one of your hobbies. All right, sounds good. Uh, we hope you had a good time, and we want you to know that there are times we take off the blue and we put on the gray, because first and utmost, we are reenactors, and we aren't fighting the war. Right. We're here to have fun and learn something. All right, Tom, thanks so much. Thank you. From Hartford City in the Civil War days, I'm Jason Witherite. Here at Connor Prairie, there's lots of activities for parents and their kids. It's nice to see families having fun together. Yes, it certainly is. Now, college students don't usually consider themselves parents, but recently members of Ball State Student Wildlife Society learned just how hard it is to get your young to fly the coop. Reporter Tom Sheck has a story from Muncie. Life above this city is about to get a lot more interesting. Six young peregrine falcons just changed their addresses to downtown Muncie. <laughs> Members of the Wildlife Society at Ball State brought six young falcons from South Dakota to Muncie to reintroduce them to the area. The main objective of this project is to bring awareness to the plight of wildlife species and endangered species. The peregrine falcon has been a poster child along with the eagle in bringing back endangered species into their natural habitat. We like to think that uh, through our efforts we kind of have an effect of uh, augmenting the population of a species that just doesn't have great numbers. Students came to me with the idea of releasing falcons in downtown Muncie and I coordinated the project, told the students uh, which federal and state agencies they needed to go to uh, in order to carry out the project. Just a few weeks old, these raptors have yet to fly or hunt on their own. The new arrivals went through a series of checks to prepare them for their release back into the wild. Document the way oh, there's a the paper right there, and just make another column. The first step, was to give them a medical checkup. We had previously weighed them earlier in the day, so we had already recorded their weights. We then wing marked them. Each bird has a distinguishing color. At that point, we placed them in their hack boxes, and we began to monitor them on a 12-hour basis to determine whether or not they were ready for release. It's very possible that our birds might go to, say, southern Kentucky or northern Tennessee, uh, but other examples of peregrine falcons migrating uh, in North America have them going down into Mexico and Central America. So it's possible that our birds might migrate uh, that far south as well. Uh, we just don't know. Once we release them, which means we actually take the front of the hack boxes off, then they have the opportunity to test their wings. With the hack boxes open, all we humans could do was wait, and wait, and wait. I don't see anything from there. It took a day or two, but the youngsters finally flew, circling over Muncie's tallest building. Usually you think of bird watching as a country activity, but this project provides entertainment for city dwellers too. Red, up here. 
in Dakota is... We've had a tremendous amount of public support. We have people come and eat their dinners in the parking lot, bring their binoculars and watch the Falcons from their cars. Um, when we're staying on the street corners, we have people stop us, ask us how Leonardo is or how Rose is, and, and ask us how the Falcons are doing. We've had a tremendous, tremendous amount of public support for this project. Their plan has worked. Since the release of the Falcons, people have been calling in reports to Ball State's Wildlife Society. The other objectives of this project, as far as Dr. Morell and I are concerned, is that people become aware of the plight of wildlife. And being in East Central Indiana, there is really no wildlife habitat left. And we felt as though bringing peregrine falcons to an urban environment where they acclimate easily was a great opportunity for the community. You know, Don, doing laundry the old-fashioned way gives you a lot of time to think. <laughs> and I've been thinking about the birds. It must be hard for them to learn how to fly. Well, if you were on that ledge for the first time in that tall building, you'd be afraid to fly, too. <laughs> You're right, I would. <laughs> well, coming up next, our story is about humans learning to fly. And our reporter, Brandon Fairman, took the Indiana Outdoors crew along on his first flying lesson. You're doing a good job. Oh, thank you. You can just keep doing yeah, it. Yeah, I think you need to do this. We're here at the Muncie Airport, where I'm about to take my first flight. I'm a bit nervous, but that's all right. So come on, Indiana Outdoors, let's fly. And before we crank the prop, we look around, make sure everybody's out of the way, and we'll say clear. Clear over there? Clear. Okay. The first thing the pilot Haddon did was go through a checklist. We started the prop. And the next thing I knew, I was racing down the runway. Yeah, have white center line right here. Okay. Yep. Squared up real good. I always wanted to learn how to fly, and this was my chance. Okay. Now, you stay on that center line now. Good. Stay right on him. Don't go off that way or this way. You're doing it. Hang right on the wheel here. Now, do your feet. Man, it's beautiful up here. Don't let the airplane fly you. You make it do what you want to do. You can see for miles from up here. The initial part of the training is a lot of the student following the instructor through a sequence of maneuvers. The instructor is, is instructing the student on what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And the student's pretty much following the instructor's every word. As they progress in the training, the student then assumes more the role of making decisions and making judgments without the instructor having to tell them to do so. And the instructor starts to step out of the active role of, of teaching and training and assumes more of a passive role of observing and correcting as necessary. Okay, now that you know how to taxi out and take off, let me see if you know how to turn. So let's turn kind of to the south. So what all you do is you just bank it a little bit, give it a tiny touch of rudder there. And then when you out to your Just kind of just pretend 
you ought to string. That string was right down at the end of the runway there. Okay. 270 Okay, two Bravo Bravo, clear to land. Two Bravo Bravo, clear to land. Most student pilots will, will confess that they get concerned about is, gee, I've learned how easy it is to take off, which is pretty easy once we've gotten through the first hour or two. I've learned how to fly the airplane straight and level and climb and descend and turn with it. What I don't know how to do yet by hour two or three is how to land this airplane. We're in too fast, we just back and chop it off, say. So we're a little bit slow, so let's give it just a little power this time. I'm sure glad my instructor, Joe Haddon, was sitting next to me. Working the rudders for me? Got him. I'm not on him yet. Little power here. Power. Little right rudder here. Oh boy. Now we need to kind of sink in here a little bit. Hold the nose off. Don't let it come down. Hit, hit the nose hard. Little right rudder here. Ah, you're getting pretty close. There. She stalled out. You feel stalled out on you? Quit, quit flying. Center line. Go with your feet. Have one. Some of the benefits that, that a lot of students and a lot of pilots will, will find out of it is they get the ability to learn to structure tasks and to prioritize tasks. That's probably the biggest thing that somebody coming out of a non aviation background wants to learn how to fly an airplane is first confronted with is how to take a series of tasks and put them into a process that will allow them to complete a goal. If you're interested in flying, if you want to take lessons, find a, an airport close to you, go out, hang around the airport for a little while, talk to the pilots that are there. If you can, get a hold of one of the flight instructors, sit them down, take them out for a cup of coffee, and ask them questions about what does the training require, what, what's the cost involved, how much time will it take. Uh, find out about the instructor, him or herself. Oh, we said we was going to go around again, didn't we? Yeah. Still want to go or you want to quit? Sure, let's go. Okay. There's 70. A little bit to the right. Come on. Don't let off. Don't drop that on me now. Let's fly. That's probably, as a flight instructor, that's one of our, our greatest joys is to take somebody that's never flown an airplane before, put them in the left seat of an airplane, do an introductory flight where we take them out on a typical introductory flight. We're actually flying the airplane five minutes out of 30 minutes. The other 25 minutes, we're letting that individual sitting in the left seat fly the airplane so they get a feel for the airplane and find out, gee, this is really for me. I hope you've enjoyed flying with me. This has been Brandon Fairman reporting for Indiana Outdoors. Well, that's our show for today. Thanks for watching. We'd like to thank the folks at Connor Prairie for hosting us today, and thank you for joining us. We'll see you again next time on Indiana Outdoors. Now, Don, I think this is a water pump, but well, I think it is too. But I there's don't no see water, any coming, water out. coming out.